Voyage of the Dawn Treader, Chapter 5. The Storm and What Came With It. It was nearly three weeks after their landing, the Dawn Treader had trawled out of North ha Narrow Haven Harbor. Very solemn farewells had been spoken, and a great crowd had assembled to see her departure. There had been cheers and tears, too, when Caspian made his last speech to the Lone Islanders and parted from the Duke and his family. But as the ship, her purple sails still flapping idly, drew further from the shore, the sound of Caspian's trumpet from the poop came fainter across the water. Everyone became silent. Then she came into the wind, the sails swelled out, and the tug cast off and began rowing back. The first real wave ran up under the Dawn Treader's prow, and she was a live ship again. The men off duty went below, and Drinian took the first watch on the poop. She turned her head eastward around the south of Arva. The next few days were delightful. Lucy thought she was the most fortunate girl in the world as she woke each morning to see the reflections of the sunlit water dancing on the ceilings of her cabin and looked round at all the nice new things she had gotten in the Lone Islands. Sea boots and buskins and cloaks and jerkins and scarves. And she would go onto the deck and take a look from the forecastle at the sea, which was brighter blue each morning, and drink in the air with a that was a little warmer day by day. After that came breakfast with and such an appetite as one only has at sea. She spent a great deal of time sitting on the little bench in the storm playing chess with Reapy Cheap. It was amusing to see him lifting the pieces, which were far too big for him, with both paws and standing on tiptoes if he made a move near the center of the board. He was a good player, and when he remembered what he was doing, he usually won. But every now and then Lucy won because the mouse did something quite ridiculous, like sending a knight into the danger of a queen and castle combined. This happened because he had momentarily forgotten that it was a game of chess and was thinking it was a real battle and making the knight do what he certainly would have done in his place. For his mind was full of forlorn hopes, of death and glory charges and last stands. But the pleasant time did not last. There came an evening when Lucy, gazing idly astern at the long furrow or wake that they were leaving behind them, saw a great rack of clouds building itself up in the west with amazing speed. Then a gap was torn, torn in, and the yellow sunset poured through the gap. All the waves behind them seemed to take on unusual shapes, and the sea was a drab or yellow, yellowish color like a dirty canvas. The air grew cold. The ship seemed to move unsteadily as if she felt danger behind her. The sail would flap limp one minute and then wildly full the next. While she was noting these things and wondering at the sinister change, there came a noise over the wind and Drinia called, all hands on deck. In a moment, everyone became frantically busy. The hatches were battered down, battened down. The galley fire was put out. Men went aloft to reef the sail. Before they had finished, the storm struck them. It seemed to Lucy that a great valley in the sea opened to just below, just before their bows, and they rushed down in it, deeper down than she would have believed possible. A great gray winter of water, a great gray hill of water, far higher than the mast, rushed up to meet them. It looked certain death, but they were tossed on top of it and then the ship seemed to spin around. A cataract of water poured over the deck and the poop and forecastle were like two islands with a fierce sea between them. Up aloft, the sailors were laying out along the yard, desperately trying to get a control of the sail. A broken rope stood out sideways in the wind as straight and stiff as if it were a poker. Get below, ma'am, bawled Drinian and Lucy knowing that landsmen and landswomen are a nuisance to the crew, began to obey. It was not easy. The, draw, the Dawn Treader listed terribly starboard, and the deck sloped like the roof of a house. She had to clamber around to the top of the ladder, holding onto the rail, and then stand by while two men climbed up it, and then get down it as best she could. It was well she was already holding tight for the foot 
to the foot of the ladder because another wave roared across the deck up to her shoulders. She was already almost wet through with the spray and rain, but this was colder. Then she made a dash for the cabin door, got in and shut it out for a moment with the appalling sight of the, and the, of the speed with which they were rushed into the dark. But not, of course, the horrible confusion of creakings, groanings, snappings, clatterings, roarings, boomings, which only sounded more alarming because they had already done uh, than they had already done on the poop. And all the next day and, and the next it went on. It went on till one could hardly ever remember a time before it had begun. And there was always two or three men at the tiller and there was as much as three could do to hold it in any kind of a course. And there was always, and there always had to be a man at the pump. There's hardly, there's hardly any rest for anyone and nothing could be cooked and nothing could be dried. And one man was lost overboard and they never saw the sun. It was over, when it was over, Eustace made the following entry into his diary. September 3rd. The first day for ages I have been able to write. We have been driven before a hurricane for 13 days and nights. I know that only because I kept careful count, though the others say it was only 12. Pleasant to be embarked on a dangerous voyage with people who can't even count right. I have had a ghastly time, up and down, enormous waves, hour after hour, usually wet to the skin, and not even an attempt at giving us a proper meal. Needless to say, there's no wireless or even a rocket, so no chance of signaling anyone for help. It all proves what I kept on telling them, the madness of setting out in a rotten little tub like this. It could be bad enough even if one has has had decent people instead of fiends in a human form. Caspian and Edmund are simply brutal to me. The night we lost our mast, there's only a stump left now, though I was not at all well. They forced me to come down to the deck and work like a slave. Lucy shoved her oar in saying that Reapy Cheap was longing to go, only he was too small. I wonder, that, that, I wonder she doesn't see that everything the little beast does for the sake of showing off. Even at her age, she ought to have a, that amount of sense. Today, the beastly boat is level at last and the, sun, and the sun's out, and we have all been drawing about what we must do. We have food enough, pretty beastly stuff, most of it, to last 16 days. The poultry were all washed overboard. Even if they hadn't been, the storm would have stopped them laying. The real trouble is water. Two casks seem to have got, got a leak knocked in them and are empty. Narnian efficiency again. On short rations, half a pint a day each, we've got enough to last for 12 days. There's still lots of rum and wine, but even they realize that that would only make them thirstier. If we could, of course, the sensible thing would be to turn west at once and make for the Lone Islands, but it took us 18 days to get to where we are, running like mad with a gale behind us. Even if we got an east wind, that might take us, it might take us far longer to get back. And at present, there's no sign of an east wind. In fact, there's no wind at all. As for rowing back, it would take far too long, and Caspian says the men couldn't row on half a pint of water a day. I'm pretty sure that this is wrong. I tried to explain that perspiration really cools people down, so men would need less water if they were working. But he didn't take any notice of this, which is what he always, which is always his way when he can't think of an answer. The others all voted to, for going on in the hope of finding land. I felt it was my duty to point out that we didn't know that there was any land ahead and trying to get them to see the dangers of wishful thinking. Instead of producing a better plan, they, they had to, the cheek to ask me what I proposed. So I just explained coolly and quietly that I had been kidnapped and brought along on this idiotic voyage without my consent, and it was hardly any of my business to help them out of their scrape. 
September 4, still becalmed, very short rations for dinner, and I got less than anyone. Caspian is very clever at helping and thinks I don't see. Lucy, for some reason, tried to make it up for me by offering me some of hers, but that interfering prig Edmund wouldn't let him. Pretty hot sun, terribly thirsty all evening. September 5. Still be calmed and very hot. Feeling rotten all day and I'm sure I've got a temperature. Of course they haven't got the sense to keep a thermometer on board. September 6. A horrible day. Woke up um, in the night knowing I was feverish and must have a drink of water. Any doctor would have said so. Heaven knows that I'm the last person to try to get any unfair advantage, but I never dreamed that the water rationing was meant to apply to a sick man. In fact, I would have woken the others up and asked for some, only I thought it would be selfish to wake them. So I just got up and took my cup and tiptoed to the, out the black hole we slept in, taking great care not to disturb Caspian and Edmund, for they've been sleeping badly since the heat and the short water began. I always try to consider others whether they are nice to me or not. I got out all right into the big room, and if you could call it a room, there were rowing benches and the luggage, you know, where and all the luggage was. The thing of water is at the this end. All was going beautifully, but before I'd drawn a cupful, who would should catch me but that little spy reap? I tried to explain that I was going on the deck for a breath of air. The business about the water had nothing to do with him. And he asked why I had a cup. He made such a noise that the whole ship was roused. They treated me scandalously. I asked, as I think anyone would have, why Reapy Cheap was sneaking around the water cask in the middle of the night. He said that he was too small to be of any use on the deck and he did sentry over the water every night so that, um, so that one more man could go to sleep. Now comes their rotten unfairness. They all believed him. Can you believe it? I had to apologize or the dangerous little brute would have t been at me with his sword. And then Caspian showed his true colors as a brutal tyrant and said out loud for everyone to hear that anyone found stealing water in the future would get two dozen. I didn't know what this meant till Edmund explained it to me. It comes in the sort of books that the Pevensey kids read. After this cowardly threat, Caspian changed his tune and started being patronizing, saying that he was sorry for me and that everyone felt just as feverish as I did and we all must make the best of it. Mm -hmm odious stuck-up prig stayed in bed all day September 7 a little wind today but still from the west made a few miles eastward was a part of the sail set on what Drinian calls a jury mast which means the bowsprit set up right and tied they called it lashed to the stump of the real mast still terribly thirsty September 8th, still sailing east. I stay in my bunk all day now and see no one except Lucy till the two fiends come to bed. Lucy gives me a little of her water ration. She says girls don't get as thirsty as boys. I had often thought this, but, ought to, but it ought to be more generally known at sea. September 9th, land in sight. A very high mountain a long way off to the southeast. September 10th. The mountain is bigger and clearer, but still a long way off. Gulls again today, and for the first time for the first time since I don't know how long. September 11th. Caught some fish and had them for dinner. Dropped anchor around 7 p.m. in three fathoms of water in the bay of this mountainous island. That idiot Caspian wouldn't let us go ashore because it was getting dark, and he was afraid of savages or wild beasts but extra water rations tonight. When it, what awaited them on the island was going to, what awaited them on the island was going to concern Eustace more than anyone else. 
but it cannot be told in his words because after September 11th, he forgot about keeping his diary for a long time. When morning came with a low gray sky, but very hot, the, adventures, the adventurers found themselves in the bay encircled by cliffs and crags that were nearly like a Norwegian fjord. In front of them, at the head of the bay, there was some level land heavily overgrown with trees that appeared to be cedars. Though which, through which a, rap, a rapid stream came out. Beyond that was a steep ascent ending in a jagged ridge, and behind them was the vague darkness of mountains. This is what it looked like. It's very mountainous. Kind of looks like the canyon in between Canyon City and Slida. through which ran dull-colored clouds so that you could not see their tops. The nearer cliffs at each side of the bay were streaked here and there with lines of white, which everyone knew to be waterfalls, though at the distance they did not show any movement or make any noise. Indeed, the whole place was very silent and the water of the bay was smooth as glass. It reflected every detail of the cliffs. The scene would have been pretty in a picture, but it was rather oppressive in real life. It was not a country that welcomed visitors. The whole ship's company went ashore in two boatloads and everyone drank and washed deliciously in the water and had a meal and a rest before Caspian sent four men back to keep the ship and the day's work began. There was everything to be done. The casks must be brought ashore and the faulty ones mended if possible and all refilled. A tree, a pine if they could get it, must be felled and made into a new mast. The sails must be repaired, a hunting party organized to shoot any game that the land might yield, clothes to be washed and mended, and countless small breakages on board to be set right. For the Dawn Treader herself, and, th and this was obvious by now when they saw her at a distance, could hardly be recognized as the same gallant ship which had left Narrow Haven. She looked crippled, discolored hulk, which anyone might have taken for a wreck. And her officers and crew were no better. Lean, pale, red-eyed from lack of sleep and dressed in rags. As Eustace lay under a tree and heard all the plans being discussed, his heart sank. Was there going to be no rest? It looked as if their first day on that longed for land was going to be quite as hard a day as hard work as a day at sea. Then a delightful idea occurred to him. No one was looking. They were actually all chattering about their ship as if they actually liked the beastly thing. Why shouldn't he simply slip away? He could take a stroll inland, find a cool airy place up in the mountain, have a good long sleep, and not rejoin the others until the day's work was over. He felt that it would do him good, but he would take great care to keep the bay and the ship in sight to be sure of his way back. He wouldn't like to be left behind in this country. He at once put his plan into action. He rose quietly from his place and walked along the tree walked among the trees, taking care to go slowly and in an aimless manner so that if anyone saw him, they would think he was merely stretching his legs. He was surprised to see how quickly the noise of conversation died away behind him and how silent and dark green the wood became. Soon he felt he could venture on quicker and more determined stride. This soon brought him out of the wood and the ground began sloping steeply up in front of him. The grass was dry and slippery, but manageable if he used his hands as well as his feet. And though he panted and mopped his forehead a great deal, he plugged away steadily. This showed, by the way, that his new life, little as he suspected it, had already done him some good. The old Eustace, Harold and Alberta's Eustace, would have given up the climb in about 10 minutes. Slowly and with several rests, he reached the ridge. Here, he had expected to have a view into the heart of the island, but the clouds had now become lower and nearer and the sea of fog was rolling to meet him. He sat down and looked back. 
He was now so high that the bay looked small beneath him and miles and miles of sea were visible. Then the fog from the uh, mountains closed all around him, thick but not cold, and he lay down and turned this way and that to find the most comfortable position to enjoy himself. But he didn't enjoy himself, or at least not for very long. He began, almost for the first time in his life, to feel lonely. At first, this feeling grew very gradually, and he began to worry about the time. There, there was not the slightest sound. Suddenly, it occurred to him that he might have been lying there for hours. Perhaps the others were gone. Perhaps they'd let him wander away on purpose, simply in order to leave him behind. He leapt up in panic and began to the descent. At first, he tried to do it too quickly and slipped on the sleep, s steep gap, uh, and slipped on the steep grass and slid for several feet. Then he thought this had carried him too far to the left, and he came up and, as he had seen the precipices on the side. So he clambered up again as near as he could guess to the place where he had started from, and began the descent afresh, bearing to his right. Here is Eustace climbing down the hill, sliding down the hill. After that, things seemed to be going better. He went very cautiously, for he could not see more than a yard ahead, and there was a perfect silence all around him. It was very unpleasant to have to go cautiously when there was a voice inside of you saying all the time, hurry, hurry, hurry. For every moment, the terrible idea of being left behind grew stronger. If he had understood Caspian and the Pevensies, he would have known, of course, that there was not the least chance in their doing any such thing. But he had persuaded himself that they were all fiends in human form. Oh, at last, said Eustace, as he came slithering down the slide of loose stones, scree, they were called, and found himself on the level. And now, where are those trees? There is something dark ahead. Why, I do believe the fog is clearing. It was. The light increased every moment and made him blink. The fog lifted, and he was in an utterly unknown valley, and the sea was nowhere in sight. End of chapter five.